You know, this is quite a uh, special events uh, that are coming up that Ari will be touring parts of Canada, Alaska, and then the northern part of the United States. <clears throat> we wish we could tour many other cities and branches. Um, he's had requests from quite a number of places and unfortunately we've had to turn them down just lack of time. Um, but uh, I first met Ari, um, gee, what was that back in, I think 2017 and then 2018, uh, MISTEC had a conference in Ann Arbor. Um, MISTEC stands for the Mysteries of Technology. And uh, Ari participated in that as well as we had in one of the early study groups that we had. Um, and I became very excited by things that Ari was able to do. Um, it seemed to me that as we were beginning to try to dabble <laughs> into the three occultisms that this tech was trying to venture into the mechanical occultism, that Ari was trying to venture into the hygienic occultism. And they're still, we're hoping to find a third person who really is leading, you might say, the uh, efforts to develop a eugenic occultism. And of course, these would be very, very uh, nascent, you know, their beginnings. Um, and these won't reach their full potential for probably many centuries, but the work has to begin now. Um, so Ari has been very popular in his presentations at these MISTEC conferences. Um, in fact, uh, one of them has stuck with me for a long time and several of us have tried to work with some of his indications that for me come right out of the statue that Steiner uh, did the representative of man, where we see, as we face this, the, uh, this representative of man on the left, Lucifer and Araman sort of together, and then under the influence, this separating of Lucifer and Araman. And Ari brought this to our 2018 conference um, with this grasping that we can, with our consciousness as human beings, bring that gesture even into mechanical devices to mitigate their harmful effects. Um, and since that time, Ari has been very prolific writing, I think it's up to about a dozen books now, and um, He's been doing workshops uh, in many places in Europe. And so we're trying to bring him here to this country. Um, it's also very interesting, just recently, uh, as a matter of fact, today, we had kind of a scare that uh, Ari might not be admitted into the United States, even though he has had COVID four times and one vaccine, the requirements are for two, it seems. and. So we've been working out all of that. Um, but in one of these occurrences of having COVID, Ari was, um, you know, in this very sick state, was able to have an experience that, for, uh, as he will be describing some, an opening for him of, uh, spiritual sight into the three elemental kingdoms. So uh, this has led to more work um, on what was indicated by Steiner about the Northern way. And this has led him to work understanding the archangel and we pronounce it here, um, Vidar, and it might be some of you Vidar, and also the mythological god Baldur. So um, 
uh, I'll leave most of this for Ari, but he's going to give a, a preview of what he'll be talking about in this tour. And part of his tour is to speak to the MISTEC conference. Um, Frank, are you on? If you are, could you say a word or two about the MISTEC conference? Uh, <clears throat> the conference will be held here and uh, Issaquah live or in person. Uh, essentially, we've had the conference going on for the past two years online. And this year, we just thought um, that it needed to be in person uh, because of the uncertainty of next year and the year after that. So we just thought this is the time to do it. Um, and the school wanted to partner up with us. So uh, so it was just the perfect uh, combination of us wanting to do live and the school giving us the space to have it in their really beautiful uh, new school that they have, which is used to be a church. So they have this fantastic auditorium with everything, all the lighting and sound system and whatnot. We're going to have six or seven uh, people come and present live. And one of them is uh, Ralph Tita from Cymatic in Germany. Uh, he's going to be here with um, the CEO of uh, Lautzinger. And, um, Lauts and it, what they do is they make headphones like, like this one, and they're about $2,200 <laughs> and we're giving one away uh, for free for those who sign up. Um, and Lautzinga is a supporter of the conference itself. Plus we have other speakers and Ari is one of them that will be coming, coming to us from Alaska online. And uh, we hope that everybody will, uh, will consider joining us for at least online, obviously. It is quite a uh, trip to get out to Seattle, and we don't expect many to come, but uh, but we do have about 40 that will be there in person, and we do have someone from Spain who is coordinating the whole presentation, so it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm having it, even though, my, even though I'm going balder and my hair's falling out. <laughs> it's a lot of stress. Let me tell you to set this up. Uh, but uh, but um, we're really looking forward to having Ari there. Uh, and everybody, obviously, there's 109 people here to, to listen to Ari. He's just a fantastic guy to uh, very knowledgeable about um, um, about these things. So uh, okay. I'm going to. Yeah. Right. So right. Andrew, Andrew has mm -hmm. already um, put out there the. I put out on your chat a uh, $50 off for all the people here today if they want to join the conference. There's a link there that'll get you a $50 off discount. So let's uh, bring Ari on now to tell us about his speaking tour and the topics that he'll be covering. Ari, let's turn it over to you and then we can have some Q&A at the end of this. So Ari. And you're on mute. All right, you're on mute. There we go. Now we go. So uh, this slightly headache have started to disappear. As I half an hour ago or hour ago thought I was not able to go on this tour. You know, I have uh, planned and I have bought tickets for uh, two, three, four thousand dollars in America, Canada, Alaska, and then suddenly they said that um, we don't accept the European. Uh, corona so, uh, license certificate, so you have to have more of this or like that. And then I thought I couldn't come, and I, uh, I'm still a little uncertain, but it seems that 
almost some higher power intervened and made it possible to uh, to travel. <clears throat> As you can hear, I have a little <clears throat> sore throat. So uh, excuse me for that. And I will talk a little about what Andrew mentioned, that especially the elemental realms. Well, uh, the, the most important is actually to realize the changes in the element in the spiritual world since the death of Rudolf Steiner. It is interesting to read the diary of Hilma of Klint, which is a Swedish artist that showed her pictures to Rudolf Steiner and Rudolf Steiner was quite upset and said, you should not show them to anybody until 1950, which she of course did. Um, but the interesting thing is when I saw these pictures, they were uh, they were taken out of the elemental world. And this part of the elemental world opened around 1950. So you might say in 1950, this special realm became uh, possible for human beings to travel through. Uh, the, the, you might say the more superficial realm of the elemental world was fully opened in 1879, uh, where, uh, according to Steiner, the divine forces led by Mikael uh, won a victory over the dark forces and the dark forces were thrown down on the earth into the human realm sort of. And what is the earth? I mean the earth, the physical creation is and Maya an illusion for the elemental world. So from that time, a part of the elemental world was open. And those who then brought knowledge from the other parts of the elemental world, as there are three parts of it, the third, the second, and the third realm, uh, they were premature and Steiner urge them not to talk about it or show pictures from that area. And he also talked reluctantly about these things and the deeper you come into the elemental world, the less at that time in 1910, 20, uh, the, the less he talked uh, about it freely, you might say. And um, this second realm opened <clears throat> in 1949. And that is quite interesting because it seems that Steiner very well knew that. So he asked uh, Hilma of Klint not to show these pictures until 1950. And there were, is still a deeper realm of the elemental world which opened 70 years later, you know, from 1879 to 1949, 70 years. A magical number when it comes to the physical creation. And then 70 more years, 2019, where the deepest realm of the elemental world was fully open for human beings to travel. So um, this, this third realm of the elemental world is related to form 
beings of form, elemental beings of form. And as they have a certain form, they are mostly dominated by Luciferic forces. And in this realm, I have been living since I was five, six years. And in this realm, you can develop hygienic occultism, which I then did through my whole life as a therapist, as a veterinarian, as a doctor, and found, this is uh, something that can be talked quite much about, <laughs> and, and earlier I, I, uh, I use most of my speaking time or course time to describe this third realm and the how to do the uh, hygienic occultism. But the most important thing, the, the thing that really is important to do this is to bring Christ into this realm. Uh, we have but one obligation in this world now, and that is to bring Christ in to the elemental realms, to the Luciferic, Aramanic, and Assyric beings, and in that way, re, uh, save to spiritualize uh, this world, the elemental world. If not, it will be materialized and lost for a very, very long time, as then the beings there in their living. So, um, and then I started to bring Christ into this third elemental realm, the hygienic part. At that time, I did not, I was not aware of the second and first elemental realm. So I was traveling, you might say, the, the third elemental realm, the superficial, more superficial, as described by many clairvoyants, as, for example, Pugacnik and others, until I was so um, lucky to get uh, long COVID. So I was sitting in front of my fireplace for a few months and having nothing to do, I thought, okay, I will I will use this time to investigate further the elemental world. And having all this time, you know, I, I had, I, I couldn't do anything else actually. So I uh, went deeper and I looked and investigated this. And then I came to a threshold which I had not any time before, I had never before met and this threshold was a, a sort of a portal or door to a deeper area of the elemental world so i was amazed and in this area this dimension of the elemental world it is in my opinion possible to develop mechanical occultism by bringing Christ into this realm. And I think to construct machines or vibrations or these things without having gone into the second realm, I think it is impossible. So when you read about Keeley, Keeley's car in America, this machine he made, which was activated by certain vibrations or instrument tones, that is only possible if he went into the second realm, as also Hilmar Klint was able to. And I think also the, uh, if you read about this uh, Austrian water, um, wizard 
Victor Schauberger. He was always also <clears throat> able to travel into the second realm and as such able to do the things he did. And nobody else have been able to copy. So it's not the construction or technological and, and it is actually yourself that has to bring forces from the second realm and by these forces make machines work. And there you have two possibilities. You can bring these forces into work without the Christ or with the Christ. In hygienic occultism, if you make these forces work without Christ, it leads to a translocation of the diseases. You push them over to others. A translocation. You don't transform the diseases. You don't actually heal. You just push them over to others. This, with the force of Christ, you can transform the diseases and not just translocate them. And this is also possible in the second realm. If you bring the Christ forces in there, you have a certain power over the molecular uh, function, the, the stuff itself, not like diseases or disease spirits and demons and so on, but over the molecules, the atoms themselves. And it is possible to bring this Christ force into the atomic force. And by such, start to develop mechanical occultism. But I think you have to go there first. It is all in vain to construct these machines before you do that. So, Traveling this second realm for some time. I, <clears throat> after a month or two, I came to a new threshold. So as Andrew said, I had a vision of the spiritual world or the elemental world. It was not a vision. It was actually really scouting, walking through it and exploring for weeks. And then I came to a deeper and in this deeper, I met the, the, what is called the first elemental realm, the elemental beings of death and birth. The elemental beings that Steiner described as genuinely evil, or the only, uh, the only elemental beings that are evil. And they belong to the Asuric part of the elemental beings. And in this realm, which has totally other powers than in the third or second, in this realm, you can actually bring also the Christ in. And by such do you, eugenic occultism, um, with or without Christ, which will be black or white magic. So, <clears throat> going, having going through all this, took some months. Then I reached another threshold beyond the first realm, the deepest realm of the elemental world. And there I came to an area where there was a huge guardian on the threshold, which I had no idea who was. I thought maybe it was Mikael. So I asked him directly, who are you? And he said, I am Vidar. And this on my left side is Balder. I knew this from the uh, Edda, the Nordic mythology, of course. But uh, I did not actually know so much about what Steiner have 
said about it. <clears throat> but then I started to investigate, especially of the cycle of the spirits of the folk, folk spirit cycle, where Steiner is very clearly say that uh, Michael is in the process of not becoming, that was in Steiner's time, of not becoming an archangel, but will be elevated to an archai, which is a gradual process. And another being will take over his work as an archangel. And this being is Vidar. And he also described Vidar as very closely connected to the Nathan soul of Jesus and also to the Buddha, Nirmanakaya or Buddha. So the Luke, Jesus' child, was very closely related to him. And he said that this this archangel will be the archangels of the north, especially Scandinavia. And his main purpose is one, to bring Christ to the south, the rest of Europe, and possibly America, of course, or other. Two, to be the folk soul of especially the Norwegians. And three, bring the new clairvoyance together with Balder, two people who can cons perceive him. To these people, he will bring a new clairvoyance. And then we might wonder what is meant by a new clairvoyance. So um, then I went into a conversation with this guardian, much the same as Steiner described with the guardian in his 19 lessons. <clears throat> and to my, <clears throat> to my uh, amazement, I must say, he started his teaching with something that I knew from before. We all have read certain cycles of Steiner and he very often starts his lectures or cycles by describing all the planetary stages in the beginning, Saturn, Sun, Moon, you know, and I thought, oh, this again, I've read this 20 times or he can start with the Indian and the Egyptian and so on cultures. And I thought, oh, again, again. This has actually irritated me, did me a little with Steiner. He always go on to a total recapitulation of the totality of development. And now I sat there in before my fireplace talking to Vida and he did the same. He started with the beginning, describing every cycle, every culture, and not only on a few, two or three pages or four or five pages as Steiner do. He used eight or nine weeks, 24 seven. And he went through all this development and I wrote it all down every day I wrote down and he had a little different aspects than Steiner had. He, he described them in a little different way. It was not contradictory, but it was another way. And he said, I will do this because today people need certain other things to be able to meet the Christ. And then he went on with this, and then he started to describe certain things that is very important. Otherwise, we will not be able to meet the Christ, he said. 
And that was actually quite a great shock to me because Steiner had done the same, but nobody have seen it. You see, one of the most important cycles Steiner gave was the fifth evangelium, the fifth gospel. It was given in Oslo. And he was, uh, those of you who have le read these lectures and also read about them, know how excited Steiner was about being able to give these lectures. He, 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 he was really excited. And one thing that Steiner uses four or five pages to explain, and that is uh, the last part of the fifth lecture and the first part of the, the last part of the fourth lecture and the first part of the fifth lecture, where Steiner described a very important thing that happened to Jesus of Nazareth in his 30th year. He became more and more aware that there was no hope for humanity. There was no power in the old systems anymore. There was no power in the medical systems because everywhere he looked, he saw Lucifer and Ariman running away to the others. That means if you, if you had an ascetic life, you were very clean, you, you did everything right, you pushed Lucifer and Armands to the others. You didn't change them, you just translocated them. The same in the medical systems. He encountered many religious and medical systems, but no system changed the demons. And then he went to his mother, and Steiner described this over four or five pages. He went to his mother and he told her about this, according to Steiner, a very famous conversation. And then after doing that, he was able, according to Steiner, to go to Jordan and receive the answer to his problem, to his great uh, quest, the Christ. And now we don't come and say, if we human beings do not understand that what we do is just to push Lucifer, Arman, and the Asuric beings to others in treatment, that is what I call translocation, we will not be able to meet the Christ. This is so important because Christ is actually the only force that can transform the demon, the demons, the adversarial beings. No other force can transform it. That is a sort of the essence, one of the essence of the Christ. <clears throat> and for me, this was uh, quite shocking actually because that means that all treatment with doctors, veterinarians, craniosacral therapists, homeopaths, and so on, they translocate the diseases. They don't transform it because they do not bring the Christ into it. And I took Vidar's word very serious and said, yes, this is very important that we discuss so I contacted the medical forstand in Dornach and said, Wait, this is something we must bring out, this knowledge about translocation and transformation. And they answered me, they said that we know about translocation, but we do not want to talk about it. Because that will take all the belief in patients on the doctors and everything away, because that means that normal healing is not moral. So. Uh, I'm still there to try to convince my colleagues to understand 
the concept of transforming the diseases or just translocating the diseases. I saw that very early when I was a veterinarian, immediately when I was a veterinarian, I saw that all the diseases in the animals come from the humans. It is translocated because we don't treat our diseases properly. And then we push them over to the animals. And then they go to a veterinarian and they treat just the animal and not the real cause of the problem, which is the owner. So I gave a big lecture in the World Congress of Veterinarians over this. And I said, this is not possible. That means if it is like you say, then we do a lot of wrong things. We... <laughs> and then after the lecture, there came a doctor from Taiwan and she said, you are totally right. We know about this in the Far East, in China and Taiwan. We know about this, but we don't tell you in the West. <laughs> And she added, added that uh, the more, but we think it is not unmoral to transfer diseases over to animals. We think it's okay because animals are lower than us. So, so we have a different moral than you in the West, which I actually already knew that the, the view on animals in the East is very different actually from the West. The care for dogs or chicken or, and so on. And she said that, but if you us are quite moral and then they try uh, treating humans, then try to have animals in the office so the diseases can go over to them or even plants or flowers. And then she added, smiled and added, and the most um, moral of us, they try to take the disease onto themselves, but they live often very short, she said. <laughs> And then I looked at her and said, but if you know this, why don't you change your system to involve the Christ? You know, not, not just yin yang and, and the Tao and all this, you know, but, and then she looked at me with big eyes and she said, change the system. Ha! And that was the end of the conversation. So this was the first teaching of Vidar what we have to do, the translocation, understand this. And then he went on with teaching after teaching after teaching. I've written it all down in two books and I'm still writing it down. And after having taught me the most fundamental things, he was open to questions, which I have to get from others. Andrew gave me a question one time, which I asked him, which will now be published in the book in uh, August. Um, so then he, at a certain time, he gave the word to Balder, the bringer of the new clairvoyance, according to Steiner, and according to Vidar, and according to Balder himself. <laughs> and uh during some weeks he showed me or explained me or demonstrated even in my own head that the new clairvoyance is not clairvoyance it is clairaudience and then i was also again shocked so i went back and looked in the steiner text where he talked about seeing christ in the etheric and then I found that he mostly do not say see Christ in the etheric, but hear Christ in the etheric or feel Christ in the etheric. And then I discussed this with a friend of mine in Finland, the former uh, leader of the Finnish Anthroposophic Society. And he said that uh, Valentin Tomberg had actually said exactly the same. We have to get away from clairvoyance because in the sight the adversarial forces can come in and go over to the hearing where the adversarial forces cannot enter. And he explained, Valentin Thornberg, from information from Steiner, explained that 
between the um, streams from the zodiac that helps the sight or helps the ears and which streams that the luciferic and arimanic forces can enter and where they cannot enter. So we have to change a lot of things, he said, to be ready for receiving or perceiving the Christ today, 100 years after. The way to the Christ is different. It is through the elemental realms, which were sealed at the time of Steiner. Now they are open. That is another way into the spiritual world and to the Christ force, which could not be done, traveled at in 1920, but which can be traveled today. And that is what I call the Nordic path of initiation because Steiner did describe the way. And it is belonging to the macrocosmic path and the Nordic path, not the Southern, not the Western, not the Eastern, not uh, the Central, but the Nordic path of initiation. Especially described by Steiner, he wanted to describe it in Russia in 1912, but he was hindered to go there. So he ended up in Helsinki. And there he described it in 1912, the Helsinki cycle, how to reach the Christ through the Nordic way. I will talk more about that when I come to America, I guess. And this is what I actually then, when I give courses now in Germany, three day courses, I, the most interesting is to train people in the Nordic way, how to go through the three elemental realms and how to reach the spiritual behind the elemental realms. Well, that was, uh, Andrew, that was a little short, uh, I cannot just sit and talk and talk and talk. I, li I like a little feedback and a little back and forth. <laughs> sure. Um, if people want to put a question into the chat, that will work. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, okay, Leon, you've got your hand up. Why don't we go first with you? He has his hand really up. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you so much for all this. Um, I have, uh, I think, three questions. Um, one is, these terms from Steiner, aren't they going to create a lot of problems for us, particularly eugenic occultism and so on? Are we going to get into a lot of arguments that are totally beside the point using this terminology? A lot of problems. I would think it would be. You know, we we as, uh, no, ordinary people associate eugenics with the Nazis and things like that, um, and that all, all these things would have to be overcome. Linguistic problems is my my thought. To well, add to what I'm saying, saying, Ari, the word occultism. Yeah, that too. <laughs> is is another one that throws certain Christian groups off as, oh, this means they work with the devil. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's- I, I tell you something, you know, the word that will bring us most trouble today is the word Christ. Yeah. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, let's pass on from that. I uh, knew people in Findhorn, and I wondered how, how you feel about Findhorn, how that fits into this awakening to the elementals. I haven't been there. They had, I know, I, I, uh, th there was a man named David Davies in England. He was kind of like the uh, partner of Sir George Trevelyan who led the new age movement there. He was like, if, Arthur, if Sir George was Arthur, David was Merlin. <laughs> He was in the background. He was very consciously clairvoyant and clairaudient. He, he healed a lot of people and he, he advised people in uh, Findhorn 
how they should proceed when their leader stopped giving them messages from her meditations. Um, I, I have also had a question that occurred to me as you were speaking. I knew a very famous medium from Cuba in Miami when I first came to this country. And she had an experience with her granddaughter who she said had been put under a curse by an ex-boyfriend. And she was to bring a dove to the grandmother. And she, I don't know, I don't speak Spanish. She did a, a ritual, genuflect this dove in front of the girl and the dove died. Yeah. Would this be a tra transfer of that kind of illness from- Yes, that's a, that's a translocation. Yeah. Okay. Which is not, which is not, which I do not like. Yeah, I mean, it, in this case, it's like an ancient uh, or a, a folklore kind of uh, approach of, of the past, as it were. But it worked for the girl. <laughs> oh, yes, it works. Like, uh, you know, homeopathy is also based on translocation. Oh. So that is modern. But still, it pushes diseases over to others. <clears throat> and that is described even from uh, what they call the father of homeopathy in America. Hahnemann. Doctor, 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 doctor. Hahnemann? No, someone... he's German, but it was an American who is considered the father of homeopathy in America. Uh, okay. Well, he described this phenomenon very exactly. And uh, in in the law, and he said it the disease moves from up to down or in to out, and then out in the fingers, and then out. Wow! But he, but he didn't question where it went. As Anna Marie said, Hahnemann, I think is who you mean, right? Yeah, it was not Hahnemann. It was uh, Otto Wolf. No. Was it Henry? Yeah. Well, it's not important. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait for others. Thanks, so well. thanks, thank, thanks so much. Right, thank you, thank you. Leon. So we'll go next to Richard Halford. Hello, Dick. Oh, good afternoon. So my question is, as a doctor, I do the meditation, how can I bring the good into the physical body? And I call... Uh, and on one level, I'm calling on the Christ in all the patients whom I treat. Now, am I tr still translocating or am I less translocating? It's impossible <clears throat> to say. I have to watch to see, to know that. Yeah. Because I can actually see these entities going out and into others. Hmm. So, uh, that has to do, I, I did ask Judith von Halle about that, how to treat without translocating. And she said it is only one way, and that is to treat with Christ consciousness. So if you have that, you transform. But if you don't, you translocate. And if what you do, I do not know. Thank you. Thank you. Please, thank you. Any other questions at the moment? Um, Stuart, Summer? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you for unmuting. Yeah. Uh, Aura, the other day I uh, watched a new cell tower get added to in the town near Harlemville. And two friends of mine and I went to a neighbor's house across the street from the cell tower. And we uh, prayed forgiveness of the Luciferic and Aramonic beings or the elementals who are entrapped there as Luciferic and Aramonic beings. Yes. 
and we asked Christ to enter into the towers or the beings activities. Yes. My question is, is this a dangerous activity for us to engage in? No. I have never seen any damage yeah. when you ask Christ to enter. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'll go to you next. Good evening, Are. Um, my question is can the patient, instead of the doctor, be um, the, 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 the vehicle for the transformation of the disease? Absolutely. And how does one do that? To realize why you have the disease, why it has come, why you have to suffer it, and then by that, transform it. Very much like um, Katarina Emmerich did with her friends. She took the disease into herself, and then she prayed to Christ, and she understood the cause of the disease, and she changed the karma for the page for the friend and she was sick in three days sick three days and then she recovered so she did it for others and what the others actually should have done themselves so you, what you're saying is that despite the fact that most doctors most especially most ordinary doctors are not even aware of this possibility of transformation, the patients itself can do it. Absolutely. In spite of. In spite of yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Are. Yeah. And all right, I, I would, um, you know, the healings in the New Testament are almost always the Christ, maybe it is always, asking the patient essentially, do you want to be healed? Yes. And that's a real question. I'm sure if you got asked that in the way it's asked, you really have to ask the question, oh, do I actually kind of enjoy my illness in some way? Do I use it to my advantage? And do I really want to be healed? So yeah, that's, thank you for that. We'll go to Amelia next. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to share a little bit also this, this strong connection with Vidar that I've had for decades and also with Nordic culture, music, dance. <coughs> and, um, you know, early attention to what Steiner and others have said about Vidar and that this being has had this path of renunciation in my understanding for 2000 years, right? from the time of Christ through present times where there was a, a holding back in a way where he could have risen in his hierarchical rank and chose to stay behind. And so my guess is that in this path of renunciation, there's a, an increase in power, so to speak, that comes about because of the renunciation. And I've conceived Vita very closely connected with the etheric forces um, and with the new etheric clairvoyance. Um, and also, as you said, with, with clairaudience, with hearing. And, and one of my early questions to Sergei Prokofiev, actually, when he came to the United States was, does Vita now speak? You know, to which Prokofiev didn't have an immediate answer. But this is something that's just very, very potent and, and urgent that lives within me is this new speaking that can come through Vidar and how Vidar is so closely connected to Michael and to the Christ. And how can, how can we help each other hear the speech of Vidar? Yes, you are totally right. Uh, Vidar is today speaking. 
and it is possible to reach him. And I think he is the most important spiritual entity today. The most important. Uh, I wouldn't say that, uh, of course, Christ and Mikael and all the others are important, but he is the closest to us. He can bring this knowledge, this truth to us, to our hearts. And uh, he is reached by walking the Nordic path of initiation. which Steiner described in Helsinki, which is described in Kalevala, which is described in Parsifal. There are several descriptions and I describe it also very carefully in my books about the Nordic way of initiation or book. Um, so that is what I think we must do today. That is my mission actually to bring this knowledge now and can you say a little bit more to differentiate the elemental world from the etheric world oh that's very different very 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 different the elemental the etheric world <clears throat> the, uh, the um, part uh, and I don't talk, and that is one misunderstanding many have today. The elemental world, I think, is the physical world around us, which is true. And then that the etheric world is within this. Because the trees, you look at a tree, there are elemental beings behind the tree, the form beings behind the form of the tree. And then you have the aromatic elemental beings behind the molecules and the atoms, and you have the asuric elemental beings behind the power and the vacuum and so on. And all this is flown, uh, is penetrated by the etheric force so that makes the tree alive. But this here, it is what I could, that is what I call the inner etheric, the, the sort of the elemental etheric. But when you reach the outer through the etheric, then you reach a pure world of pure etheric. Um, it is so interesting to mark uh, the inner etheric is like flowing crystal water. The etheric flows through the branches, through the animals, through ourselves. But when you come to the outer, through the elemental worlds and to the outer etheric, then it is like filled with clouds. And then I realized that uh, in, the, uh, and in the Acts in the Bible, when the Christ is moving up to the spiritual world, he go up into the clouds. That is the outer etheric. Huh? And these two angels tells the ap apostles, the disciples, that he will come back in the clouds. And that means we have to go through the three elemental realms to reach this world and bring Christ back into the elemental world. He is not in the physical world. We have to bring him in there. Marco. Thank you. Um... So I have two questions. One is about um, a practice I've just been studying called biogeometry come out of Egypt, the work of Ibrahim Karim. And in that system, um, they work a lot with what they call, what Dr. Karim has identified as biogeometry three, um, which is an energy, a combination of three energies that comes out of the center of things. And, and they've identified it as kind of the most um, life enhancing and, and what gives nature its structure. And as I was um, introduced to this system, I was thinking, you know, it, it reminded me of what I know from your work. And I 
saw a parallel between like increasing the energy in the system and calling on this divine energy and and they're referred to as separate things but i was wondering if you're familiar with that system and if you see a resonance there where um instead of talking about it as christ consciousness they talk about it as um the biogeometry three energies no i'm not okay. familiar with that system so i i do not know okay um, and then my other question is about um, if you have any plans to offer trainings in the U.S. I mean, for those of us who who are familiar with your work and really want to go into it further and um, and study it and and learn our way through these three realms, um, what hmm. would you do? You have any recommendations? for trainings. Yeah, well, if I'm asked when I'm there, of course, I will uh, <coughs> describe some trainings. And me, even uh, if we have uh, half an hour, we can go at least part, yes. I did that in Stuttgart now uh, a few months ago and in three days we were able to reach the outer threshold but we worked hard three full days only by going through the elemental realms so it is possible but i need a little time and you get very tired when you when you train so uh you cannot do it all in five hours <laughs> that is not easy. Laura? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Ari, um, thank you very much. And I'm appreciating this transmission, what feels to me of an experience of Christ that I've never had before in my heart. So what my- uh, What do you mean transmission? Uh, that I'm feeling that through you, from you, there's a force that I'm receiving. Okay, that's what you that meant. It, that, yes. Um, so my concern um, has to do especially with animals and um, a way of being with and relating to animals that I perceive as uh, abused, not well taken care of. And I'm wondering if you have, uh, and they're not in my charge, you know, they're not necessarily in my home and uh, perhaps they're uh, living in homes with, with humans or some of them in shelters or, or whatever. And, and if there is a way of um, inviting, you know, speaking, praying from a Christ, essence in my own heart to to help to help them and uh i realize this is very complex because the abuse is done by humans who have lots of karma that you know so there's this um but i'm, I'm just wondering if you have any suggestion around you, you can uh, you can do that to animals you don't have to ask anybody just, if you see an animal that is suffering, you can open the middle and call on the Christ in the middle. Uh, yes. Yes. The thank only, you. The only thing you can only you cannot do is human beings. Then you have to be asked. Ah. Uh, okay. But animals and uh, mechanical things, or trees, or uh, plants, you can do it. But with humans, you do need to have permission. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you. And I, I do have one other um, question, or this has come up just since you talked about clear audience. And about 27 years ago, I had a miscarriage. And in the middle of the night before I started miscarrying, I actually heard a voice that said, you don't have life in you anymore. 
Mm. And is is that an example of of a clairaudient experience? Again, uh, it is. I, I anything that I actually don't see or experience and can relate to what happens is difficult to say. So it's um, I have actually to uh, observe to be sure about these things. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, well, thank you. You've answered my question. And but it is not uh, impossible. It is maybe even likely that it is, but I, I cannot say more than actually you can. Yes, I think that's a question I need to to live with for me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Jacqueline. Hi, Ari. Um, I have two questions. And uh, one's related to, in one of the teachings, I work as a healer. And one of the teachings I was taught was to, as Christ is the spirit of the earth, uh, one way to offer um, anything you're working with in a person is to offer it to the body of the earth uh, as the Christ. Um, I've been uh, reading all your books and really taking in this idea about transforming through the Christ. So I'm trying to find, um, are there specific techniques like this one I just mentioned uh, as a possibility, or is it only through the middle, which of course um, I'm still working, <laughs> trying to learn how to do. Um, so that's one question. And the other one is, are you familiar with German new medicine? Um, oh, yeah, I, I, uh, that was my neighbor. Oh, Ham Dr. Hammer? You know, I um, I got um, a thick book by Dr. Hammer. Yeah. And then I thought I have a, 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 this 10, 20 books lying that I think, oh, now I must read that. Mm -hmm. So then one afternoon I sat down and thought, now I will read this book by Hammer, Dr. Hammer. And then I opened the book and I thought, no. I will visit my friend, the potter. I have a friend in Sunnyfjord who is a potter. And I went up to him to talk and have a cup of coffee. And then he said, you know, I, I got a new neighbor. It's a German doctor, <laughs> it's Dr. Hammer. So I was invited in and I sat talking to him for a while. And he wanted to make a film with me and him together. <laughs> but uh, the result is that, uh, what is the question about him actually? Well, it's uh, not about him specifically, but I've been studying German new medicine for four months yeah. and using myself uh, yeah. as the guinea pig for the, tech, the, the methodology. And I have found it to be quite uh, helpful, very accurate in many ways, working with conflict resolution um, as uh, sort of the impetus or the beginning of a psychosomatic experience, which leads to a symptom eventually. Mm. I wanted to know what your thoughts are on working maybe with that idea um, in healing, in helping people become conscious of why well, they may be sick. Yeah, well, he had uh, no relation to Christ. True, yes. And he, uh, at that time when I met him, he had become totally crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm, I mean, insanely crazy. Okay. So I, uh, I, uh, I have read his books and there are some things there that is right. You know, this is psychosomatic and spiritual, but without, this is a translocative way of looking at it. Okay. And uh, he also developed, uh, for example, he said to me that, um, and he became a very, very Nazi. So he said to me, uh, all women, all dogs with breast cancer, get it because they are irritated on the dog next door. <laughs> and I said, all dogs with breast, with, uh, breast cancer? are irritated on the dog next door? Yes, all. 
Mm. So I said, uh, well, how do we, and, and you have to get rid of that problem, he said. And I said, well, how do you get, how do you get rid of the dogs next door? Because all dogs have a dog next door. Yes, you have to do the final solution. He said, kill them all. And then I said, just like the Jews, I said. And he said, yes. <laughs> and we talked German. Yeah, yeah. das is richtig. <laughs> so I, I actually, I, I gave up on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Um, yeah, thank you for that, because of course I don't know him at all, but um, or didn't know him. Um, what about totally, the first question? Totally, totally crazy, but crazy yeah. people yeah. also have some truths. Yeah. 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 Okay, so psychosomatic um, has a place with you bring in the spirit, looking at some uh, disease or illness. Oh, like no, they bring in, in demons. If you have fear, yeah. It creates a fear entity, a fear elemental being, or a fear demon. And this fear demon can create cancer, of course, mm -hmm. or irritation. And then you can get rid of it, and then you transfer it to the neighbor instead. Mm -hmm. And he was more on that level. It was no transformative, no uh, love, uh, no uh, transformation, no cry. So I, I, I didn't uh, like his system, actually. Mm. Thank you. Hmm. OK, thank you. This is, this is great discussion. Just to let everybody know, we've got about 15 more minutes only. We've got to let Ara get a, a decent night of sleep. So we'll try to <laughs> finish up in the next 15 minutes. Panagiota, you're up next. Panagiota, Panagiota, yes. Oh. Hello, hello from Greece. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, well, Ari, I would like to ask you, I've read many of your, of your books and I've read about the Christ consciousness and all these things. I would like to ask you, like practically, many of us work with computers a lot. We work a lot with all these powers that come out of the computers and all these things. So how can I practically have this Christ consciousness in my everyday life? How can I keep it? Like, would you like to offer some kind of advice? Like, how can I sustain, sustain this consciousness throughout the day? Like, what can I do? Okay, I can pray yeah. and I can- Yeah, you have, you have asked, you have asked. And I have been thinking quite much about it. What is the essential thing with Christ? What is the essential of his teaching? Like you're asking me, what is yeah. the essential? Um, not extremes, possibly in love, love yeah. and avoiding yes. extremes. Yes, you have love thy enemy, which is very central. And also, let's say you turn the other cheek. If somebody hits you here, you turn the other cheek. And I, it took me a very long time to understand that, you see, when you go directly onto something, a spiritual being, if you look directly at it, if you treat it as an enemy, for example, you look at the 5G mast, it contains very strong elemental beings, demonic beings. And if you look at them as, ah, oh, they hurt me, or this computer hurt me, or whatever, then you treat the enemy as an enemy. And that is not Christ consciousness. But if you say to this mass or the 5G or the electromagnetic radiation or whatever it is, I will love you. I will bring love into your midst. Then something very strange happens. It changes. It becomes unpathological. So that is actually to bring Christ consciousness into the healing. You must love the disease. You must look at the disease as an expression of karma, something that is there to teach you, to learn you, to mm -hmm. teach you how to change. 
and uh, and then it might totally totally change mm -hmm. even very serious diseases if you embrace them and don't think immediately how can i get rid of this how can i what medical can i medicine can i take can i take antibiotics there of course you can use antibiotics but if you sort of embrace them then you have the christ consciousness and that brings a very different aspect into it Mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah. yeah wonderful that's good questions and and uh that's um wonderful uh all right i i'm gonna move on to becky but becky you have to come off of mute if you can becky mcgrath hi hi ari thank you for your offering um, I really appreciated you uh, mentioning the Helsinki lectures of 1912. I've always felt that it is the grail path when I look at Christian Morgenstern and what he had to work with to transform his soul and completely etherize his blood under the indications of Rudolf Steiner. I yes. think there's something really holy about that this was also given to the Russians that were there in the private lectures he gave to them mm -hmm. um, and also the Kavala and all those other lectures that were there. Uh, it seems to me that this also this description that you're describing of the transformation through healing through the Christ consciousness um, also relates to um, what um, Rudolf Steiner explains to us by Francis of Assisi in the foundations, the spiritual <coughs> foundation of morality, where he also, when he healed people from leprosy, also looked at their karma first and was in dialogue with them. And, um, and this, all these healings were done through the Christ consciousness, through the moral forces he had developed, which the morality, these forces are directly connected to Vidar's my understanding. And um, you could even look at the deep connection that St. Francis had from being the greatest student of Gautama Buddha would put him in direct correspondence to the angel of Gautama Buddha, which is Vidar. And then in the eighth century, St. Francis of Assisi incarnates in the mystery schools of the Black Sea under the direct guidance of Gautama Buddha and also Christ, which would bring these impulses of this true healing force that you're talking about, where it's transformation through the Christ consciousness rather than uh, this having it go out to other people because to me that's like an Essene thing where um, if we don't transform it in ourselves I just feel like I transform it in myself so I can hold it in its rightful place so it doesn't become a burden on others and that's the most important part of this rather than being so pure that you push it out of yourself where it goes into others or you don't even recognize that it belongs to you and some of this also seems and I'd love to know your thoughts part of the task of us meeting the lesser guardian of the threshold is for this transformation to happen um, through Christ in the path of consciousness in knowing what is ours and being responsible for it karmically in this transformation so that we not only help transform it, but that it also can help the earth. So I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yes, uh, <laughs> you summarized actually totally what I think. So I totally agree with you. But what I thought when you were describing my thoughts on hygienic occultism, which is actually what you describe now, is that the same goes for mechanical occultism. To go into the mechanical occultism is not to construct a machine or three dimensions or gold or different metals. It is to bring this consciousness out from the second realm of elemental world in the Christ consciousness. And with this, you can make a totally different effect from the atoms and or molecules. I have tried it once or twice. 
uh, I gave, uh, this is will interest you, Andrew. We were in, uh, in uh, Totnes <clears throat> and we had a, a course or a discussion there by dynamic mostly. And then we sat in a very little room and then I said, uh, and it, the, the air started to become very, very oxygen, deoxygenized and much CO2. So I, I said to the participants about 25, now we will do a uh, try because you see in this area, it is possible to do some mechanical occultism in the west southwest of England. This was Cornwall area, Totnes. And then <clears throat> we did not go into as we do in hygienic occultism. Then you go into sort of the body and you watch the Luciferic and the Arimanic and the Assyric and you make space for Christ in the middle. And then the Christ force can stream into the the disease sort of and change. But we, we went into the, the second realm, into the oxygen atoms and made the same space for Christ there. And everybody breathed so much lighter. The air changed by doing this with the oxygen. So I think this is very important. And when we in the future or later or whatever, when it is, go into the first realm, then do the same there. Then we can influence the eugenic uh, powers for occultism. I think it all has to do with bringing Christ into the elemental world. Yeah. which is the adversarial world. So hopefully we'll be talking more about that All right, when you're in uh, Wilton, New Hampshire and in New yes. York and Boston. So. Yes. And we can also demonstrate it. Yeah. Well, also is um, just to add for me, from my experience working with all that Rudolf Steiner brought in the healing arts, I do believe that these healing arts that are coming out of anthroposophical endeavors absolutely correspond with the Christ consciousness, whether it be eurythmy or the speech arts or the painting therapies that they've developed, that it does work um, in this way very consciously. And, and just to remember that Rudolf Steiner said that the karma has changed. So when we can work on these things in our, in us, and transform it in us, it also helps the rest of humanity as well, because Christ has um, designed it in such a way that we can also help, um, even if people are not able to go into those realms, you know, in the way that you're describing, there are other ways people can help on whatever level they're working on with the Christ consciousness in the healing in the world. So I just yeah, like to add that. That is totally right, because one, thing I have observed is that when you do this Christ sort of infusion into something, it spreads. It starts to spread. It spreads physically. Thank you, Becky, for all of that. We'll go on to Anthony Prezel now. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Becky. Thank yes, you. I know I know time is tight, so I won't be uh, lengthy on this, but Steiner did point out that uh, Vidar was asked to become the Folksal of, uh, of Norway. That was his task. And what you just explained today, and thank you, Ari, is the reason why in preparation for what's coming. Yeah. And the, North, the Nordic mysteries are, are going to play a great part. And part of that, of course, is Vidar's task to lead in the war of all against all and destroy the Fenris Wolf. Yes. Which, which appears to be the old consciousness in preparation for the Christ consciousness, which is to come. Could you say a few words about that? But you say it's so without, without, without getting so like you say it so perfectly yourself. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> you describe it perfectly. I said that I think that 
Vidar is today, when I mention Vidar to anthroposophists outside uh, Scandinavia, they have, they have no clue what I talk about. They don't even know about him. They think that Mikael is the archangel and Vidar is some uh, Nordic god from the Edda, which is not. He is mm, probably, or he, she, is probably the most important spiritual being today in bringing the Christ. And if he is not perceived as such, we will be, we will be uh, lost in our path, our our, our venture in this physical world. And that he comes from the North or Norway is, I, I, I do not know why actually that is, <coughs> but Steiner said that the Norwegians were the people in the world that had the closest relation to nature. And one of the obligations of the Norwegians after death is to teach the other people about the love of nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vidar is actually quite close related to this love of nature, which is the macroscopic way. Think about uh, in Kalevala, the Mariatta, she, she go into the forest, she see the beauty of the forest, and that brings her the Christ. In the 50th song in Kalevala, it brings her the Christ. And that is why I think it is a, a, a Norwegian, that the Norwegian from Norway can bring this stream into Europe, as Steiner said and also, of course, into uh, America mm -hmm. or the whole world in that manner. I, I, I cannot say it actually more than that. Thank you. Anthony, thank you. What, we have time for one more, Peter. You've had your hand up. Yeah. Unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you. First, I want to thank Ari for all that you're bringing to us. Ari, the clarity, uh, I think it's very, extremely important. Um, my question is around healing, and um, it seems to be a big topic in amongst all of this also, uh, obviously from your background also. Um, mine was, uh, I had a healing trip, well, I, I did healing, if you like, my practice was in Hawaiian Lomi, uh, it evolved into a conscious body work, and uh, it very much relates to what you were talking about, in that the disease is an expression or a symptom rather than the cause, and it was a consciousness cause, and that's what my work uh, moved into. And it was profound in respect that when the individual would access that experience that was locked or, or anchored in the body system and causing that disharmony, uh, that disease, that disharmony would um, discharge, it would disintegrate and go away. But in my practice, I got to a point of a, a I'd call it a moral dilemma. Uh, in that everybody was looking for me and coming to me to create this healing. And my practice was not about what I was doing. It was just encouraging the individual to find their own conscious experience that was embedded. And when they did, they were the actual healer. It was a very hard thing to get across to people, for them to embrace and actually recognize that they are the healer rather than uh, myself or someone other. And so the moral dilemma was that, well, I didn't feel, it didn't feel right to be healing people as such. And it felt more that it should move to more the uh, empowerment of the individual to be the healer. Now, all of this was, if you like my background before, 
anthroposophy. I, I feel it was actually my preparation for anthroposophy. And uh, through the Christ now, it, of course, it takes a whole different, different uh, uh, arena, domain. So my question is, um, when we do these healings, when people do healings for others, are we actually doing them in today's world, in today's level of consciousness? Are we actually doing the individual an injustice, uh, uh, doing them harm in some way, rather than uh, looking for that empowerment or to empower them? <coughs> Am yes. I making sense? It was quite clear. And I do agree with you. I think that healing, like let's say giving antibiotics, needles, craniosacral therapy, herbal therapy, without empowering them, without bringing this transformation in, is actually not helping them at all. Mm -hmm. It is the opposite, I guess, because then I have to go through it again. Mm. Yeah, that was my experience as well with them, that they would come back with the same symptoms, the same um, conditions again. Or the neighbor, or the neighbor, <laughs> or, or the, the neighbor, yeah. Or the horse, yes. My kahuna, the kahuna I trained with, actually, he, he talked about that, that uh, we should take on the, um, the disease. We get to know the disease, exactly what you were saying. And then rather than this cleansing and, and shaking off and everything, he said to us one time, he said, where do you think that's going? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's going out. Somebody else will get that. He said, stop that. Yes. Yeah. But that, stop. yeah, it's that empowerment of the individual. And through anthroposophy now, of course, it's become very clear that um, the empowerment of the individual is really the recognition of the Christ. Yes. And, and opening that relationship with the Christ is paramount. Um, which, you know, I often have arguments with people about uh, <laughs> the ownership of self. Oh man, know thyself, as Sina uh, reminds us. So thank you. Um, thank you. Both, actually, Andrew as well. Thank you, Peter. Oh. Um, and I, I just let people know I put the itinerary for Ari's speaking tour in the chat. If you want to uh, grab that URL, you can link and see where he's going to be in the coming months. Ari, right, you leave on Tuesday, right, for Toronto. Monday, I go to Toronto, yes. Yeah. Boston and then up to Toronto. So you go from Toronto, then to Calgary, and then on Calgary, to Calgary, and then up to Fairbanks. And then down to Chicago. Right. And then across the northern parts of the United States yeah. and then finally getting to Boston where you will fly yeah. back to Norway. So Hopefully. I hope um, those of you who would like to be in person can join us in one of these venues. And with that, I will send it back to you, Andre. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, dear Ari. Dear Andrew, thank you so much for a great presentation. So dear friends, um, so the video will be uploaded on our website. Uh, probably you can check uh, tomorrow or Monday. So it will be there. And uh, yeah, thank you again, everybody for joining us. Uh, please feel unmute your computers and say thank you to Ari and to Andrew. And I will finish the meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. So thank you. 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 so much. Yeah, and good night, Ari. Right. Sleep well tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. thank you, Andrew. See you later. Yeah. Blessings on your travels. Nice friends. Nice friends.